Hello and welcome to Empowering the World, Shaping a Promising Future, a special APAC coverage by CGTN that brings together young people and experts from APAC economies to tackle pressing global economic issues. I'm your host, Elaine. And I'm Dean Young. This year's APAC meeting is held in San Francisco. They put emphasis on resilient and sustainable development. Why and how? Today, we are trying to find the answers with a lineup of entrepreneurs, scholars, and the social influencers. Our goal is to foster cross-border communication and provoke new thoughts to old issues. That's right. And you can catch our APAC Youth Forum on various platforms, including Facebook, YouTube, X, TikTok, Weibo, Douyin, WeChat, Yang Shiping, Bilibili, as well as CGTN's official website. And don't forget to leave your comments to stay connected with us and be part of our conversation. Today, we are joined by 11 industry representatives, two special consultants, and 13 observers from 21 APAC economies. A warm welcome to all of you guys. Welcome to join us. And also today, we are delighted to have two media partners with us. They are from TV Peru and Venom Soha Network. Welcome to the show. Hi, Jennifer. Ni hao. Hola, Beijing, desde Lima, Perú. Soy Jennifer Cerecida, periodista de TV Perú, el canal de todos los peruanos. Y es un gran placer participar en este programa especial de CGTN en el marco del Foro de Cooperación Económico Asia-Pacífico, APEC. Este es el canal de todos los peruanos y TV Perú se suma a esta gran realización y cobertura de, estos de este gran evento internacional. Es un gran placer acompañarlos y así empezamos este programa especial. Thank you, Jennifer. We also have our media friend from Vietnam. Hi there. Xin chào mọi người, tôi là Phương Thúy, đến từ trang thông tin điện tử Soha Việt Nam. Tôi rất vui được tham gia một phần hỏi đáp trong chương trình đặc biệt APEC của kênh CGTN. A big thank you to our media partners. We will meet them again soon along the way. Prior to the show, CGTN did a poll on social media about what APAC has achieved. Let's have a quick look at what our followers have said. From this board, you can see that we basically ask a simple questions. What do you believe are the greatest achievements of APAC economies over the past three decades? And here are the top five answers. Let's break it down one by one. We can see the highest percentage goes to number three, which is facilitation of Asia-Pacific economic integration. Almost half of our followers agree with the economic integration. But also the second and the third goes to promotion of free trade, as well as advocate for sustainable development and environmental protection. And don't forget our viewers also point out that the cultural exchange and collaboration as well as advancement of digital economy and technology advancement are some of the greatest achievements over the past three decades. Mm, exactly. All those big words such as integration, uh, free trade, sustainability, all sweet words that the world used to take for granted. But some are worried that we can no longer do so today. Connect to this results, we also surveyed the comment sections of APAC-related news on social media. And here are some keywords. Let's have a look and see which of them resonated with you the most. So there are a total of 21 word keywords, yeah, Dean, right? a lot of TIO in there. Exactly, a lot to digest. But in our next segment, you will be listening to three keynote speeches. We're going to invite three of our guest speakers to be on the stage, and they're going to choose only three keywords based on this list. And they're going to share their stories related to APAC. So with that, now let's enter our first segment, We Inspire. Inspire. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Chris Pereira, founder and the CEO of Impact. Chris. Hi everyone, my name is Chris Pereira. Uh, I'm originally from Toronto, Canada. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Meishun uh, Impact. I actually quit my job a few years ago to do what I'm doing right now, and the mountain I'm climbing, to be honest, is a difficult one. It hasn't been an easy few years. Today we're talking about APEC. Uh, as young people, um, there's uh, a few keywords that I think are really, really useful um, when we look at the future in APEC. Um, I think the future is in Asia. And if we look at the, the three key words that I think are really interesting to think about, 
First is resilience. So resilience goes back to what I just mentioned about not giving up. You're going to run into a million different challenges as you get older uh, in your life, in your work, in your relationships. Uh, I'll give you an example that when I started my business, um, you know how many no's I had to get to get one yes with a customer? To sign one customer, you have to get hundreds of no's. And sometimes the no's are yeses that are actually later no's. Resilience is important. As a young person, no matter if you get, a, you get a great degree, you go to Tsinghua University, you go to Harvard University, you go to Cambridge University, after you graduate, you're still going to face a million challenges. There's no golden ticket to success. The successful people are the people who have failed the most, only they don't give up. Okay, so resilience is something I think is very, very important. Uh, the second, engagement, is a very interesting keyword. Engagement, you can view it from a country-to-country -country perspective. You can look at it from a culture-to-culture -culture perspective. You can also look at it from the mountain that you're climbing. How do you successfully climb a mountain? You need to put your feet on the mountain and climb. You need to grab the branches. You need to climb the ladders. You need to engage with the mountain. Engagement for me is communicating. You need to, you can't do it alone, in other words. You need to listen to other people. So when we engage with others, other countries, other cult cultures, other individuals that we don't always agree with, I think we can be more successful and learn from each other. Engagement is extremely important. And the last key word, uh, collaboration. Again, you will not succeed alone. You can't do anything alone. You can't brush your teeth without someone making your toothpaste. You can't have a shower without someone preparing the water, making the house, preparing the entire community. You need, everything you do is based on collaboration. That can be in our city, it can be in our country, it can be global. We need each other. So if you're going to do something in this world, you need to have a network, you need to make friends. So collaboration is extremely important. So resilience, engagement, and collaboration, if you ask me, those three things go back to what I always tell my son, who's only seven years old, <laughs> I tell him every day. Uh, we need to be bold, we need to be brave, we need to work hard, and we need to never give up. And during APEC 2023, I hope that our leaders and our community will also not give up on engagement in resilience and collaboration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, for sharing your insights. And next, let's welcome Jackie Wong. Culture, education, partnership. My name is Jackie Wong, co-founder of 1003 and author of Polo in China and Polo Rulebook. Six years ago, I started my polo journey when I had the opportunity to take a polo lesson, and I have not looked back since. Polo is a sport played on horseback. It was once popular in the royal family and the army, and it's known as the sport of kings and the king of sports. It is a sport jointly played by man and horse and integrates various elements from other sports, such as equestrian, field hockey, ice hockey, golf, and football. At the same time, polo is a sport in which male and female players can compete on the same field, which fully embodies the spirit of gender equality. As polo enthusiasts, my friend Paris Luo and I founded 1003 with the mission of sharing this wonderful sport and lifestyle with everyone, as well as reviving Chinese polo culture. This company is a trailblazer in the polo industry because in a short period of time, we managed to establish our own polo education system, polo rating system, brand name, and tournament system. In seeking to promote Chinese polo, we established many partnerships with local governments, polo clubs around the world, and polo retail brands. We also made waves in Thailand, the UK, and Argentina, where we sent our members for polo training and participated in several tournaments abroad. Most significantly, in Argentina, I embarked on a trip to watch the highly anticipated final showdown between the top polo players at the Argentine Open. During my time in Buenos Aires, I picked up a book called Passion and Glory, A Century of Argentine Polo, which showcased the glorious and passionate history of Argentine polo over the past century. After returning from Argentina, I read through the book and an idea came to mind. 
can I write a book showcasing the glorious history of ancient Chinese polo and the development of modern Chinese polo? I looked into several published research on ancient Chinese polo, which gradually gave me a better understanding of Chinese polo history and the need for a comprehensive book on this topic. From there, I decided to embark on the journey of writing the book Polo in China, which chronicles the history of polo in China. The initial impulse to publish a book gradually evolved into a passion, a responsibility, and eventually a mission. The upgraded sense of responsibilities and mission bolstered me to face the challenges, especially as the time commitment went from the originally planned 10 months to four years. My sense of mission drove my efforts to spend the time and resources in writing this book. Incorporating both ancient and modern polo, the book has nearly 400 photos of ancient Chinese polo historical artifacts and modern Chinese polo. Many precious photos about polo are presented to readers for the first time. Although it is a niche sport, polo is also a sport with ancient roots and history in China. Out of 20-something emperors in the Tang Dynasty, 11 emperors played polo. As one of the most representative sports in ancient China, polo has irreplaceable significance in Chinese history. During the 1984 Los Angeles Olympic Games, the Chinese Olympic Committee presented a large polo in the Tang Dynasty tapestry to the International Olympic Committee as a national gift. When Chinese President Xi visited Argentina 2018, he presented an embroidered work of women's polo in the Tang Dynasty to the Argentine president. These examples fully illustrate the status of polo in China. It is a symbol of prosperity. Although it has been submerged in time for hundreds of years with the continued promotion of Chinese polo culture through book publications, educating the next generation of Chinese polo players and established partnerships with entities domestically and abroad, this robust and magnificent sport is on the rise again in China. The next generation of polo players forges ahead shouldering great responsibility and a mission to rejuvenate Chinese polo. I hope that people can join me in embracing the sport of polo and join in the revival of Chinese polo culture. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Our next speaker, an outstanding singer and a former member of the multinational boy band Into One. He certainly knows how to capture young people's attention and hearts. Let's see how he attracts yours. Ladies and gentlemen, Mika! Hello, hello. Um, first off, I want to thank the CGTN APEC Youth Forum for inviting me here today and giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, so today, the three key words I'll be touching upon are culture, collaboration, and diversity. Um, and pretty much what I'll be talking about today is embracing diversity and pursuing my dreams. So first off, my name is Mika Hashizume. I'm 24 years old. I am a singer-songwriter, and I'm currently based in China. Um, I've had the privilege of living in a diverse cultural setting throughout my life. Born and raised in Hawaii for 15 years, then Tokyo for seven, before relocating to China, where I now reside. As of now, I mainly identify myself as a music artist who also has a keen interest in fashion. Um, today, I want to share with everyone my journey of pursuing just one of my dreams, by embracing diversity and collaborating with other cultures. The reason I say one of my dreams is because I think for many young people, life can be really confusing and just choosing one career path seems almost impossible. Likewise, when I was younger, I also had no clue what I wanted to do or what I even could do. Uh, from a young age, being born, raised on a small island with little opportunities, I always had my hopes leading to a future where I could independently live in a big city. But it always seemed really out of reach, since not only did I not have the financial ability to leave Hawaii and enroll into university, but I also didn't have the academic scores at that time to qualify for scholarships. My only hope at that time was my love for soccer. I had already been training for seven years, won the state championship multiple times, qualified for nationals. And at the point where I was counting on soccer to be my ticket out, I received the most random opportunity to audition for a music label. Although I've never really considered pursuing music, um, I knew how important music was to me as a listener and how many hard times it got me through. Being curious and at least wanting to give it a try, I auditioned, and by some miracle I passed. The moment I marked the first time in my life when I had genuine choices. I could either choose my comfortable life in Hawaii, be with my friends and family, and continue my love for soccer, or move to Tokyo, start a new life and a new career. Now looking back, leaving my home, I really believe was the best decision I've ever made. 
It opened my life to opportunities I never imagined possible, and from then till now continues to change my life. My perspective on opportunities and what I would consider possible has even changed. In the past, I would often dismiss certain options due to my inexperience or unfamiliarity, and especially due to language barriers. However, after two life-changing moves going from Tokyo to Beijing, I really believe life has no boundaries. Before moving to Tokyo, I was a kid who spoke little Japanese. Subsequently, after moving, I perfected my Japanese and found my interest for fashion and business. Before moving to China, I spoke no Chinese and only had the chance to visit the country once. But now, I can confidently say that my Chinese skills have improved significantly, and I've been able to continue pursuing my love for music and fashion. Being able to collaborate with people of different countries, learning their culture, both in and out of the workspace, and embracing the diversifying experience of living in countries out of my comfort zone, I believe is the best experience and biggest influence on the way I view my possibilities. I think the takeaway from this is that I want anyone, not only young, but anyone contemplating the future, to not limit the opportunities available. Choose the path that resonates with you, irrespective of your inexperience or unfamiliarity, because you never know what might unfold. There is no such thing as making the wrong choice. No matter what, through every decision we make, we grow and gain a deeper understanding of ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Big thank you to our keynote speakers. So after we're listening to three wonderful speeches, now we would like to turn to our two special consultants. Here we would like to invite both of you to give us some background knowledge about APAC and tell us what's the significance of it. So the idea of APAC actually started in uh, 1989. That was like 30 years ago. And nowadays, APAC has 21 member economies in the Asia Pacific region. Um, and over the 30 years that have passed, uh, APAC region's economy has grown from uh, 20 trillion back in 1990 to over 60 trillion US dollar nowadays. So that's like three times the economy size back in 1990s. And one of the key drivers of such uh, amazing economic growth is international trade. So the APAC region accounts for, I think, more than 50% of global trade volume or value. Um, and that's accounting for both uh, global exports and imports. Yeah. yeah, so besides the significant economic growth experienced in the APAC region, we've also seen a more balanced, more inclusive, and also my, more di diverse growth in the region. So we are seeing that, for example, one billion people were raised from poverty uh, during the 30 years of APAC. And also uh, in 2020, over 74% of APAC residents are connected to internet through their desktop or mobile devices. And that number is a mere 1% in 1989. So with all of these developments in technology and connectivity, uh, generations of young people are able to uh, pursue their dreams, whether it's starting a new business or to promote a sport or even to become an international uh, pop idol like Mika. But before we move on to the next phase, let's hear what our media partners have to say. Y en el desarrollo de este programa especial de CGTN, sabemos que ustedes también están contando con la participación de jóvenes líderes eh, que forman parte de los miembros de las economías, de las 21 economías que, foran, eh, que forman parte de este foro APEC. Aquí también nosotros tenemos a un joven líder peruano, del cual vamos a conocer pues, eh, todas sus apreciaciones y también conocer el valor que le da pues, al desarrollo del foro APEC de, en estos años. ¿Cómo está Jorge Chávez? Bienvenido. Hola Jennifer, ¿cómo estás? Es un gusto estar con ustedes. Uh -huh. Y es un gusto eh, conocer tus apreciaciones también a propósito. Eh, queríamos conocer qué valor le das tú, qué aporte le das eh, tú a la realización de este eh, foro APEC, eh, que sabemos tiene pues ya más de 30 años de realización en el desarrollo de la región y del mundo. Bueno, APEC surge en el año 1989 con la idea de liberalizar el comercio y las uh -huh. inversiones en el Asia-Pacífico, la región económica más dinámica del mundo. En un principio, lo que quería APEC uh -huh. a través de las llamadas metas de, de Bogor era lograr la liberalización del comercio para las economías eh, en desarrollo para el año 2010 uh -huh. 
y en el año 2020 abrir las economías eh, en, en desarrollo, ¿no? para tener un área de libre comercio del Asia-Pacífico. Una mirada en conjunto, ¿no? en la cual las economías puedan beneficiarse de manera conjunta. Claro, beneficiarse a través del fomento del, del comercio, de la inversión, pero también de la cooperación técnica. O sea, APEC ha sido un espacio donde no solamente se han logrado acuerdos multilaterales, uh -huh. sino acuerdos bilaterales de libre comercio, de inversiones que han promovido la prosperidad en, en la región y acuerdos también de cooperación económica en distintas áreas. Uh -huh. A propósito, sabemos que en el foro APEC ¿no? la conforman 21 economías y hay dos de ellas que son preponderantes que es Estados Unidos y China. ¿Qué importancia tiene la relación bilateral entre ambos países para conseguir esta ansiada prosperidad y paz global? Bueno, estamos hablando de la relación bilateral más importante uh -huh. del mundo. Estamos hablando de un comercio bilateral de más de 700 mil wow. millones de, de dólares. No estamos en un contexto de guerra fría uh -huh. en la que haya un desacoplamiento. O sea, hay una, una enorme densidad de, de intereses entre estas dos eh, economías, eh, por supuesto que existe interlocución política al más alto eh, nivel. Hay áreas ciertamente conflictivas en, en el campo de, la, de, las, de la seguridad, ¿no? o sea, hay sus particularidades, pero estamos hablando de una relación donde también hay retos comunes, por ejemplo, el combate al, al cambio climático, o sea, uh -huh. la, la situación que sí, estamos sí. viendo, eh, el combate a la proliferación nuclear, el combate al terrorismo, la necesidad de tener un mundo en una uh -huh. situación de, de paz, reduciendo los conflictos, redefinir las, las reglas de la gobernanza global, definir estándares para tecnologías críticas como la inteligencia artificial, el combate al narcotráfico, uh -huh. el combate al terrorismo. Hay una serie de aspectos que son centrales en esta relación tan importante que tienen Estados Unidos y China y donde estos países, que son las dos principales economías del mundo, están llamadas a cooperar al margen de las diferencias que tienen. ¿no? Intereses comunes entonces. Ahora, Jorge, sabemos que hay una iniciativa china que se llama La Franja y la Ruta y el Perú es una de las economías que también participa en esta economía y que sabemos que incluso eh, coge conceptos ¿no? eh, muy puntuales del foro APEC como el tema de la integración económica, la cooperación y tener una mirada conjunta. ¿Qué tan importante ¿no? es que el Perú sea también una economía que participe y esa mirada que se le da ¿no? con la franja y la ruta? Bueno, la franja y la ruta es una iniciativa que fue lanzada por el presidente Xi Jinping en el Ajá. año 2013 con la idea de desarrollar una serie de corredores económicos por vía terrestre y por vía marítima a través del desarrollo de infraestructura, como uh -huh. aeropuertos, puertos, ferrovías, eh, caminos que puedan integrar a las economías. Y es una iniciativa que, si bien es cierto, en un principio comenzó enfocándose en Asia, en Europa y en África, se ha vuelto una iniciativa global. Como has dicho, el Perú es parte de esta iniciativa. De hecho, Ajá. el próximo año se espera que se inaugure la primera etapa del puerto de Chancay, que es una inversión de más de 3 mil millones de dólares, eh, una inversión de la empresa china Costco, y se espera que el presidente Xi Jinping la, la inaugure. Entonces, ¿de qué manera la Franja y la Ruta conversa con APEC? Porque APEC Ajá. tiene la agenda de promover la liberalización del comercio, de las inversiones y de un desarrollo sostenible y equilibrado. O sea, hay conceptos que se, que se conjugan ahí. Claro, porque la franja y la ruta, a través del desarrollo de la infraestructura y a través de la cooperación también en materia científica, en materia médica, en materia uh -huh. de, de energías renovables, busca precisamente desarrollar un desarrollo compartido, busca una prosperidad compartida a través del de acercamiento entre las economías que se da con la infraestructura. Uh -huh. Entonces, ahí yo creo que hay una mirada... Eh, conjunta que, de convergencia entre ambos espacios. Interesante, Jorge, ¿no? Y me quedo sobre todo con eso último que has dicho, una mirada ¿no? conjunta hacia un futuro mejor. Muchas gracias, Jorge, por habernos acompañado. Muchas gracias. Y nosotros damos ahora el pase allá a nuestros colegas, nuestros compañeros de CGTN. Adelante. Now, let's move to the next segment. We connect. Well, in this segment, we are going to welcome our guest speakers on the stage and engage in a meaningful discussions within APAC community. We also have a panel of uh, participants joining us online. Alexander. Very nice to see everyone. I'm Alexander from Hong Kong, China. I work for US asset manager Invesco. I help to head up ESG investing in Asia. So I've come from experience of um, sustainable investing. Um, yeah, thank you, CGTN, for the invite. Pleasure to be here. Ivan. Tell us a bit about you. Yes, um, my name is Ivan Park. I'm the founder and CEO of Dropflow Inc. 
I'm located here in Seoul, Gangnam, South Korea. Um, I've been in the e-com space for the past decade, and then it led me to a situation where I was um, dealing with a lot of um, car-related tools and parts. Let's uh, start our discussion. In the first question, Chris, I'll start with you. You've been active both sides of the Pacific. You certainly have sensed the wind is no longer just the tailwind. Sometimes it can be strong headwind. What is the biggest challenge now you are feeling mm. in this environment in Asia Pacific and especially to young people? Yeah, it's a good point. And to use another metaphor, when you're climbing the mountain, the weather can change, right? Sure. But your goal is the same. So I would say uh, the friendships around the world in every country, weather can change, but the, the goal of win-win cooperation, friendship is the same. So over the last 20 years since I've been in China, I've seen firsthand the growth and the, we were just speaking about the billion people that have come out of uh, poverty in, in uh, APEC. These people are now competing globally. They have a global mindset. We have people in, in South Korea. We have people in Singapore, young people here in, from Hong Kong and from mainland China. These people are going abroad and competing. So I think this is a, uh, a challenge, but also an opportunity for the international community. That uh, I guess well. for you, we need to address the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. You worked for Huawei, right? I did. You yep. used to work. I used to work. Yeah, used to work for yep. Huawei, and uh, a lot of things happened to Huawei recently. But not recently, but over the past few yep. years. And uh, is those are those events uh, some sort of a wake up call for you, because you're working across different countries? Yep. So uh, I was actually sent from Huawei HQ to North America to support Huawei. Um, so I did climb that mountain. You are the also. man as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, um, I think the, uh, so first of all, Huawei and all Chinese companies uh, today uh, are uh, using more advanced technology. They're more competitive. And I think the, the challenges that Huawei faced uh, previously were a result of the competitive strengths of, the, of that company. So I think that's, that's something that uh, is one of the reasons it happened. For me personally, of course, it was a, a surprise. Uh, my life was in Shenzhen. Well, surprise is yeah. a light word, <laughs> definitely a light word yep. to, to be, describe it. To be, so I think one thing I would give uh, advice to for young people is when those challenges happen, so my life was upended, I was sent to North America after living in China for a long time. Um, when you have an opportunity for an adventure, you should say yes. Mm -hmm. So Professor, I'd like to ask you, you are a mentor, you're a tutor to young people when it comes to setting up their own businesses. Yes. Are you terrified by what Chris just said? <laughs> <laughs> well, Colder weather, higher mountain. I would say all the young generation that are ready to do it, I would actually encourage you to take the challenge. That's why when the young people are asking me, they are trying to do the startup, they want to be successful. And that is where I would like to give them the advice. And there's a term that I am advising them to, to think about. It is called innovation at frontier. Because obviously when you are doing the startup, you are doing the, the innovative project, you try to be successful, you try to be at the frontier. That is why in the, in the school, we have been collaborating with the industries. We want to make sure that all the people, you are learning what the industry are doing already. Then when you are starting at the same point as, as them, you can actually create something that can give them the, the impact. And actually that is only one of the parts. There are two other really important portions. The, the next portion that I would like to, to, to say, it is actually from design thinking, that is actually one area that I'm also actually uh, teaching the students. In design thinking, there's a term called empathy. Empathy it is about how much you understand your users, the stakeholders, and the business. Mm -hmm. The main reason why we need to look at this one is that if you are trying to create an innovative project that to be impactful, you need to be able to address their pain points. Otherwise, why would people are listening to, to, to you? They, they, they wouldn't. So once you identify the pain points, then you can actually develop. Then it brings us to the third part. This third part we call it the entrepreneurship. As an entrepreneurship, they need to design their, their business model. Where with the business model, you need to make sure that it is viable, it is desirable, and it is feasible. And if it is actually having a, a good business model, then and other things that I will ask them to think about of their business is how to scale up. So this is where global connection, it is coming to place. Um, but building on you know, what the professor has said and just coming off of you know, some personal experiences, co-founding 1003, um, it was definitely a lot of different challenges. I mean, first of all, polo is a niche sport and it's something that 
you know, some people may have heard of or some people may not even know about the sport at all. So uh, first of all, it was about, you know, making sure everybody had the knowledge or knew about the sport. And the second of all was making sure, you know, people didn't think that this was just some noble sport or expensive sport and to, you know, give access to, to, to more young people and to newer generations through social media, through short videos, through new sort of new media um, streams to allow more people to know about this sport. I know that you work with the UN. Yeah. And you work on gender equality. Yeah. And do you think now the environment in Asia Pacific area, in the uh, APAC economies, now the, uh, uh, the startup, the new business, this uh, environment is better for women nowadays than before? I think it is getting a lot better for women these days. Um, I did my PhD research on female entrepreneurs in um, early 20th century China, and I can say for sure, I mean, nowadays it's definitely a lot better for female entrepreneurs, although there are still many challenges that females face, um, but I think the environment is getting better, and there are more females that are, you know, coming on to starting new businesses. And bringing, and bringing on this uh, new challenge. And we hope for more gender diversity in this field. Before that, I'd like to move to you, Alexander. How do you identify opportunities from challenges? Yeah, I, again, I love that very simple question, but very difficult and challenging one to answer. But you know, what we always like to say is, you know, for a lot of risk, it's always the risk and opportunities are on two sides of the coin. Often it's from risk that actually creates opportunities. So give you sort of two examples, right? And again, from an investor perspective, if we were to take a lens on globalization and sustainability, the two big you know, risk or opportunities that we see is maybe question one is, you know, can supply chains, green supply chains be global? And the second question is, can green financing be global? And what I mean by that is, if you think about uh, some of the things that I've mentioned, you know, renewables, EVs, a huge part of their supply chain um, has been global uh, historically all this time uh, with a huge focus in Asia. Uh, but because of, again, concerns like energy security, um, self-reliance, a lot more countries are building localized uh, green supply chains. That creates new opportunities for innovation. But at the same time, there are also export opportunities. If you can find the right pockets where you have competitive advantage. In. So that's sort of one question. The other question is, again, green financing. Um, historically, there has been a lot of cross-border investments into this area, uh, but the challenge is, again, because every region has different sort of sustainability standards, geopolitical uncertainty, uh, it has affected cross-border investments. If you have sort of um, innovations and companies that you know, can provide quality growth, it would be attractive investment opportunities in this time. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. And now we need to go come back to what the observers have, we have here. Who would like to Raise your hand first to ask what you want to know to our panelists. Oh, okay, we have uh, someone, uh, the gentleman. And my question is from Chan Lao Shi. Uh, I want to ask you, in your opinion, in the next 10 years, where do you see the strongest economic or trade cooperation between APEC countries? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. It is actually a great question. And what I see indeed, it is we are moving on not just to look at the physical alliance. We are looking at the virtual connections. Imagine this. Do you think we can have a world without boundary? I think that is actually what we are all looking for. And indeed, when we are looking at the current technology, and one of the technology is the cloud computing, it provides a perfect infrastructure platform that to make it happen because people can connect data can connect, the algorithm, the computing, we can work it together, so it will create the possibilities on, on making this, the world without boundaries, to be the next, I would say, the great things. And indeed, when we are looking at these technologies, cloud computing, a lot of people will be saying that, and with cloud computing and also with the AI, does it mean that we need to have a lot of engineering so that it can happen? No, it is not there anymore. Because actually just this month, I went to uh, an industry leading summit in Hangzhou, and they are showcasing a lot of the technology development from the different companies. What we are seeing that is that they have already built up the model, the infrastructures, that even if you don't know about the engineering or computer science part, you can actually use some of the applications. 
you can use the, the, the utilization tool and then to build up your AI models and then you can actually work it up with your, your connections. That is how what we, we are calling it the global connection through the virtual infrastructures. So I would see that that would be where we are going to, to, to be. Another gentleman. And what's your name and where are you from? Yep, hi. Uh, my name is Xiao Heng. I'm from Singapore. So my oh. yeah. And so your question is to Chris. Yeah. Oh. So actually, um, I enjoyed your speech. I like the. I especially like the men, uh, mention of how in a globalized society, talent is coming from many different places. So my question today is to hear your thoughts on how would you then advise the youth um, to become more engaged global citizens to write and prepare for these challenges. Uh, <clears throat> it's a great, great question. So how to, how to face the challenges of this more diverse and international uh, market? <clears throat> I think the first thing is uh, exactly what you mentioned. You're going to face challenges. How you face a challenge is how successful you will be. When I hire someone, the most important thing is can they face uh, uncertainty and can they face uh, adversity. When someone says no to you, very impolitely, if someone's angry with you, how do you solve, how do you address that? So when you're going from Singapore overseas, or from my case, uh, from Canada overseas, from China overseas, how you deal with those people will decide how, you're, how successful you are. But also, this is the opportunity I mentioned to be uh, engaging with these people, because wouldn't it be a really boring world if everyone agreed with you? Right? It's actually a, amazing that there's, some, there's people who have ideas that I don't even understand, and that's how they live their life. Well, I just break it for you. Um, Talking about the geopolitics, talking about the China-U.S. relation, we know that Meng Wanzhou from Huawei was an episode, yep. and uh, you who lived with that episode. And uh, what is your lesson from it? The first lesson is no matter how bad the relationship, how bad the challenge, the argument, there's always a way out. And to go back to our metaphor from the mountain, the bad weather, winter will end, and mm -hmm. spring will come. So the mountain will still be there. And the mountain will still be there, and you should continue. You should not give up. So I hope that uh, at APEC 2023, this can be the first signs of spring. So sleep on it and fight on. Yep. Is that the short answer? Yep, that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And thank you for, oh, sure. Please join me. I echo this. I echo this. Because during, uh, during the bad weather, the good thing is that you get uh, less competition, right? Like when we're in such an um, economic situation, a lot of very talented people won't get a chance to work for Wall Street, for the internet giants. This is a really good time to get them and do something meaningful. It helps you and also help them to live closer to their dreams. After the break, we'll enter the next round. We're talking about culture. See you in a minute. From sustainability and digitalization to trade, health, and energy security. 21 major Asian Pacific economies gather to address the most pressing global challenges and to create a future of sustainable economic growth. Join CGTN for our coverage of APEC 2023. Welcome back to CGTN APEC News Forum. So when we talk about the Asia-Pacific region, it is not only about dynamic economy, it's also a region with rich cultural diversity. So APEC has always been actively involved in a lot of initiatives that foster cultural exchanges, especially among the young people. So in our second discussion, we are going to dig deep into such cultural and youth exchanges within this region. And specifically, we are going to see how young people are promoting diversity and inclusivity in this region. And I'm very glad to join me by six panelists. Five of them are joining me here and one is joining me online. Welcome. And let's start from Mika. Yeah. So how about we start with Into One because uh -huh. this is the first like cross-cultural multinational boy group here in China. And it's part of a very important like symbol for you. Mm -hmm. So my first question is, working with so many artists from you know, China, Japan, as well as Thailand, yeah. how's the chemistry working? Actually, I think it was pretty um, unexpectedly well. Even though in the beginning, we all couldn't really communicate with each other. Um, I couldn't speak Chinese before when we first started. And a couple of the other members also couldn't speak Chinese. And 
there were mainly Chinese members in the group, and it was hard for us to get our points across and to discuss mm -hmm. and to kind of become friends in the beginning. But then after a while, um, since we were mainly based in China, I feel like most of the foreign members really had to push themselves to learn Chinese. But it wasn't hard at all because all the Chinese members in the group really tried to help us and teach us Chinese and to teach us about the culture. And likewise, we also taught them about foreign culture. And I think it was a really good experience to um, start living in China. It's really hard, I think, to enter this industry when you can't speak any Chinese and to all of a sudden have to be able to express yourself and to prove yourself that you um, are supposed to be in that position. So I think just all in all, that whole experience, I think, has really helped me um, to sit on this stage today and to kind of push myself today since I'm now solo and not in that group anymore. So I think it was a great experience. Well, I think you should be very confident with your Chinese now because, you know, on Weibo, Mika yeah. has over 3 million Chinese followers. And yeah. I know you have, like, covered a lot of Chinese songs. Yeah. What's the experience like? Yeah, I definitely think just going to different countries and being able to really immerse yourself and to just speak that language for years, I think is a really cool experience. When I first was studying about Chinese music before I came here and before I entered that show, that um, initially was my kickstart to being in China. Um, I was listening to a lot of Chinese music and what um, was considered popular in China. And I found that there's so many sad, like so many slower songs, not necessarily sad songs, but I guess it could be considered sad songs, but just a lot of slow songs, a lot of folk songs that I didn't think would be considered pop. But I think that's really cool because my own style is very folk and very slower. Um, yeah, so it's just uh, an industry where I think I really fit. I think after going through different industries in different countries and having different companies behind my back and hearing their opinions. Um, I think it was just a really cool opportunity that I landed in China and that the music industry somehow just perfectly matched my type of music as well. Yeah. Well, I may come to you later, but now okay. let's first move to our next guest. Because in Mika's case, I think music it becomes something that connect with a lot of people. But I know in Jackie's case, that is the sport polo. Actually, in Asian Chinese, polo in Chinese are called qi chu, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so actually this is a kind of a form, basically we will think that polo is a sport of kings. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, is it changing? Like, is it like more ordinary people are engaging in this sport and see it as a cultural like exchanges? Is it yeah, definitely. I think more, especially now, I see more young people playing this sport. Whereas 10 years ago, you would have a lot of sort of middle-aged men who have a lot of disposable <laughs> income play this sport. But these past five years, I've seen a lot of young Chinese people start to play this sport, especially with our um, 1003 China Polo Heritage Project. We have a lot of young people trying to learn polo as it is a niche sport and a lot of people want to use utilize this sport not just because they love it but also as a platform to you know engage with other students across different schools um, like Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard and Stanford mm. um, so it is a education platform as well as as well as a, a team sport as well that you know really allows you to engage in all these different attributes your collaboration your teamwork your endurance and it definitely helps these young people um, learn a lot of different skills. That's nice. So after hearing what Jackie has shared with Polo, do you guys want to try maybe sometime later? Of yes, course. Yes, one day, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure, well, you can be their mentor. <laughs> yeah, right? for sure. <laughs> cool. Then let's move on to Yuvo. Wow, you are a very interesting, actually, ac architect. Uh, recently, I've noticed that you've done a some of project related to AR. Could you share with us now? So it, just on the subject of cultural immersion, uh, I wanted to introduce a bit of a story of what I've been working on and where I've gotten to currently. Um, so I just wanted to share this. Uh, it kind of begins for the last 12 years, uh, most of which I've spent living in Asia. Um, I really uh, took to traveling to and researching different Japanese onsen, or hot springs, um, and kind of uh, going across the country, documenting them, and uh, currently I'm writing a book on onsen and architecture. Um, 
these are the some, some of the works featured in the book. Uh, but on a previous research trip just a few months ago, I had the good fortune of meeting the, this guy on, the, on my left here. Um, this is Jun Liao. He's uh, born in Hong Kong, uh, went to Harvard for architecture school, then uh, moved to Japan. Uh, we met by chance at a party, uh, and I told him about the book that I was writing, and he said, wow, that's so interesting uh, because I'm working on a platform to gamify travel, and uh, I'd be very interested in using the onsen content of your book in order to help with that. And I thought, wow, that sounds very interesting, but I, I really didn't understand what he was talking about yet. So he took me and he showed me what he's been working on with a team, and the way I usually explain it to people is it's, uh, it's an AR software. It's like Pokemon Go, but if you replace Pokemon with places in the world. So you'd arrive somewhere, you'd uh, scan a QR code to, on your phone, and a game would pop up and take you through the place through the vehicle of a game narrative. So rather than uh, opening up a lonely planet and creating an itinerary, in, itinerary by yourself, this would be a curated digital itinerary that takes you through, in the real world, the places that uh, would be recommended to go. I know one of the big reasons uh, that we're looking into this is because the younger generation, a lot of times, even when they travel and see the world, are looking at their screens. So the question is, how can we uh, kind of combine digital and physical in order to have people have a deeper interaction and a real cultural immersion with the places that they travel? Wonderful. So thank you for sharing with your diverse experience. And also now we are going to continue with Anjali. Uh, so actually you are, we know your background is you now are a Schwarzman scholar here in Tsinghua University in Beijing. And previously you had your undergraduate program in Australia and you had your like exchange program in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. So such a, you know, diverse study program, what has it brought to you? Uh, I think it's brought me uh, quite a few different things. Uh, one of them is, a, is a, a sense of wanting to learn and have that curiosity and an openness. So for me, when I was about 19 years old, I was looking at all of my peers around me and a lot of them were going to Europe or to the United Kingdom to do their um, exchange programs so to go do further study. And I was thinking, but what about the countries that are closer to Australia? What are the countries that um, we, we are so close to, yet we don't quite understand. And I think coming from Australia, um, a lot of Australians tend to think that uh, Bali is Indonesia as opposed to Indonesia itself and I think that comes from this perception of not really understanding the country despite the fact that it's probably one of the most populous countries in the, on the planet and is set to be one of the largest economies by 2030. So for me going to Indonesia in particular really opened up my eyes to a whole different world and really allowed me to understand better the culture and the language and also the development um, policies over there and to better understand what kind of knowledge can I bring back to Australia and share and contribute to that space. Like how can we as two countries collaborate? And I think it partly also affect your next choice because you decided to study here in yes. Beijing. What's that like incentive when you're making this choice? Yeah, I think a lot of the time when I was studying my undergraduate, China was always um, touched on in some aspect. It was always as part of the equation that I hadn't really quite explored. And I think uh, being an Australian as well, uh, China is one of our largest economic partners. It's, um, we have important trade relationships with the country, yet I feel that in the last few years it's been difficult to access China first because of a pandemic, but also because there's a lack of China experts and China skills in Australia. So a big part of it was really uh, wanting to have on the ground experience and wanting to be part of a very globalized um, network. Uh, the Schwarzman Scholarship is very international in its flavor and I really wanted to tap into that and understand better and have conversations with people and, and understand how, does, how to understand a country from within rather than from outside because prior to that I, I felt that I wasn't getting that, that full knowledge. Cool. So actually I saw Mika, you kept nodding your head. You, yeah. Do you have a lot of agreements with Anjali? Yeah, I feel like looking at your journey, I kind of resonate with that, mm -hmm. also moving around. And yeah, I feel like your, your view to go to different countries abroad and try to bring what you learned there back to your home country, I think is something that I also 
resonate with and look at. So yeah, I agree with a lot of things you said. Yeah. And one thing I can like see like from your previous speech that that you guys are bold enough to stay out of your comfort zone. Is that yeah. correct? Is that correct? I <laughs> think so. I think I've become addicted to going outside my comfort zone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's definitely um, something that often I have to push myself, but often I think the only way to really f figure something out or, or find a new discovery or make some sort of transformation is to really push outside your boundaries. But once you start doing it, it becomes much easier. Perfect. Yeah. And then let's turn to Joseph because actually, you have like cultivating a lot of students to like direct their career path. Mm -hmm. And one thing I know from 10 years ago, you have been advocating is cross-cultural studies, yeah. right? Why do you see that significance so early to 10 years ago? I think that is because it is the critical part to drive innovation, to drive the change of the world. And when we are looking at what project can be done, and of course we always start small. So where you would have your pilot projects, pilot schemes to do it in your own countries, in your own regions, but then you need to scale up. Then that's why you need a global perspective. That is why when we are trying to look at the different education, I would say method, that is why we have got the, the whole stretch, the spectrum to support them. On one hand, we try to get the students to learn from the best, the, the best from industry, academics, research and even government so they can really have a full perspective and then can, they can have the exposure. But on the other hand, we really want them to learn by doing. So they really need to actually get their hands on, working on it and then with the teams. Actually, so this is for a lot of youth streams. Actually, in what like Angeli and you are sharing is that youth can play a so important part in such like cultural exchanges. Mm -hmm. For this, I really want to move on to Sanada because I know you were once a judge of APAC Voices of the Future, and it is like a youth leadership program under the APAC, and which can allows like young students to directly speak to like global leaders. Could you share with us your experience there? Yeah, it was a really great experience because um, it's okay. Like um, I have to like uh, take you aback a bit because my background is in future foresight, right? So like um, these youth coming together, trying to solve um, global challenges together, like all the future issues such as um, global warming, social inequalities and other issues. And it's really fascinating seeing the younger generations from many countries working together. Like, I think diversity really brings out the best innovation. Like, when you have um, youth from many different backgrounds, different upbringings, different culture, um, that's like the perfect ways to um, exchange and create an innovation together. And, um, going forward, actually as a foresight researcher, I just want to um, kind of talk a little bit about um, uh, how futures of youth will do cultural exchange and corporations um, with like every trends that going on in the world right now. For example, um, aging populations, increase in global talent mobilities, and also with younger generations um, values about work that's been changing, like interest in gig economy, working in a different job part-time, for example, that will drive a lot more vibrant um, global workforce um, scenarios that will have to need, that will need a lot of you to be able to work beyond borders and being very adaptive to different culture. Actually, thank you for sharing that because we see that the use actually is a source of innovation. And also we've seen that the culture is also a source of innovation. And also we now would like to invite all of our observers. Maybe now is your time to participate in this discussion. Any questions you wanted to ask to our panelists? Thank you so much. So hello, my name is Rhino. I'm from Canada and I'm now studying here in Beijing. So I think on stage we have a perfect example of a number of creatives in a variety of industries. And I think the question that's on a lot of businesses' minds is that 
exactly what is the role of creatives. So my question, and this can go to any contestant, or sorry, uh, <laughs> any individual, <laughs> is that um, what is the role of creatives in international cooperation? What would you define that as, and what do you see that evolving into in the future? Who want to take the lead? Well, I definitely think the role as a creative First off is to express yourself through your creativity and your own work. That's the main thing. And then I feel like, um, to answer your question, I feel like at the end, to expand on the word international, I definitely think that any work, um, like any artwork, any form of music, I feel like is a really good way to express yourself and express a certain uh, intention or a certain meaning or anything you want to promote yourself and I feel like definitely music um, it's not I feel like a good example is like in Western music right now there are a lot of um, like pop stars I guess like Rosalia or like Bad Bunny who are not mainly from the US but they're definitely pop icons in the US and they definitely promote their own culture um, and I definitely think that's like a really good example. And for me here, I'm not born and raised in China, but I'm based here now. And I try to use my Western influence and just my influence throughout different countries to help me make something that's really special to me, that's really different in this uh, music environment right now. So I definitely think that any form of creativity, any form of art is a good platform to express yourself and express anything you want to share, even if that's your own culture, if that's anything you learned from your past, yeah. That's wonderful because I also think that music itself is, is a space for, of expression of diversity, yeah. right? Yeah. I try to answer it from a different perspective. From a professor perspective. <laughs> and so when we are looking at APEC and uh, EC, EC stands for Economic Cooperation. So when we are looking at it, in the very center, it is about human and people. So how we can actually bring the best values to them. So of course, two of the key thing is about inclusiveness and also connectivities. So again, when we are talking about creative, it is still go back to whether you understand your stakeholders pain point, and then you get the team together, you find a new way so, so that so you can address those, and then you can actually bring them to the, the better solutions. So that is what I would actually define and creative. It can be on any industries. And that's why we, we now need creative persons to bring forward industry transformation in all the industries. So that is actually my answer to you. Thank you very much. Anyone maybe wanted to, like the, uh, the, our last chance, maybe anyone wanted to have a try? <laughs> okay, let's give to this side. Hello, I'm Hong Kai. I'm from Singapore, and I'm a Yanqing scholar at Peking University. Um, this question is for both Jackie and Yuval. So both of you have worked in very different cultural contexts in various parts of Asia and the West. Uh, in your experience, what is the biggest cultural difference or misconception that exists between Asia and the West that you've encountered? And how do you navigate that? Thank you. Well, um, I feel like in Asia, there's a big sort of familial or group mentality type of, um, type of mentality, whereas in the West, it's more sort of individualistic. Um, so that kind of changes the way that people view things or do business um, or do certain activities. Um, so there's definitely a lot of cultural differences um, in addition to sort of the language barrier as well. But I think with technology now and social media, I think these barriers and these cultural differences are, are being more alleviated and people are more sort of culturally aware as well. And I'll add maybe to kind of answer that and answer another question at the same time since we're contestants on a show. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Um, I think creatives and people uh, in, in that type of industry really have the ability to cut through some of the cultural barriers uh, that might limit uh, kind of uh, other types of immersion into a place. Um, so through a kind of creative vision or whatever idea somebody might have, um, it, it really has the ability to maybe go a bit further and go around certain cultural barriers, mm -hmm. uh, th those types of visions. Yeah. Wonderful. I think they are very great answers to your questions. So now we'll save some time to leave for our guests because it's a you know, great opportunity. Some of you have some common backgrounds, like those of you who are architect. 
now it's time for you. Maybe you have raised any question to each other. May I? Sure, Joseph. So I would like to ask a question to our fellow architect friends. <laughs> and so from your perspective, how do you think the youth, they can actually drive the transformation of the architectural industries or design industries? Hmm. So, I mean, I think something that drives culture quite a bit, and I'm sure Mika knows a lot about this, is uh, social media and how important it is in getting people to places. Um, I think, of course, the younger generation was born into this, much more well-versed, let's say, than um, kind of previous generations. Um, and I think if the power of that is harnessed into kind of positive cultural interactions versus, let's say, boom-bust cycle of like, this gets super popular and people go here and then it's deserted the next day, somehow the culture and the excitement around social media can be harnessed uh, into more D deeper interactions with places, with cities, mm -hmm. with art, with culture, um, then I think we'll be moving in a positive direction as a society. Great. Thank you. That's a wonderful answer. Actually, the social media has like transcend so much kind of different cultures right now. Oh, I really also want to hear about Mika's experience because, yeah. uh, I mean, for music, of course, you are, don't have to be in some country in order to know about this, yeah. this area. So what's your own personal experience related to this? Um, well, I guess, I think at first, my view on social media, I feel like I wasn't really for it at first and I wasn't really on social media when I was based in Japan mm -hmm. and I was kind of just trying to live my day-to-day -day life and um, sort of prioritize. Um, I was in college studying fashion business and that's what I wanted to prioritize. So I wasn't really trying to pursue music anymore and do anything related to music. But I definitely think that after I came here, I have realized the importance of social media and how big of a platform it is for me to just show anything, any form of work that I want to show, not even my own, but anyone that I support. So I definitely think social media is a really big impact to the world right now. Perfect about answer. Anyone you want to share with some like ideas about this? Because I think for the youngsters, I one thing Generation Z is different from like a previous generation is that they were born with such kind of a booming internet and everybody is connected on the internet. So maybe Anjali, can you share with your experience? Because we also know that you are doing a podcast <laughs> and it's about women in suits, right? Yes. Yes, it's called uh, Women in Suits, and it was a creative project that me and a friend of mine who's a fellow lawyer decided to start back in Sydney. And initially, it was just to really showcase trailblazing women in law and get, get into conversations to figure out what makes them tick, you know, what is their words of inspiration. But very much now, it's become a really fantastic way to amplify voices. And now being in China, I've now also been sort of connecting with different uh, women in different fields who are doing incredible things. and being able to interview them and share their contributions and voice to an Australian audience is so powerful because that's the kind of um, access to information that most Australians don't have. There aren't many young Australians in China, first of all, who can tap into the networks here and bring those voices back home. Thank you so much. And with your answer, now we are going to conclude this part of our conversation. And one thing that we can be for sure is that culture, cross-cultural exchanges have been such an indispensable part of our lives. And it's helped to bridge the uh, bridge all the connections with people from across the country, especially in the Asia Pacific region. Thank you guys for the discussions. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back to CGTN special coverage on APAC Youth Forum, Empowering the World, Shaping a Promising Future. Now, before we start this segment, which is about sustainability and technology, all those big words, I'd like to do a tiny poll on every one of you here. 
answer this question by showing your hand. Please, for those who believe that artificial intelligence will take away your job, please show your hands. Raise it up. <laughs> Ivan, <laughs> you are the only person <laughs> present here today who believes that your job will be taken away by artificial intelligence. Absolutely, absolutely, 100%. I was actually talking about it the other day. Uh, I believe within three to five years, we'll, have lot, we'll see a lot of companies, billion dollar companies with only three people in it. We, when we're talking about technology and the sustainability, there's a simple equation in a lot of people's minds, which is the better technology is, the more sustainable development we are going to have. But on the other hand, represented probably by Ivan and a lot of more people out there, it's a mixed picture. When we're talking about the sustainability, it's definitely from the point of view of a human. But what if a technology one day can arrive, can develop into a point where human is no longer needed, then sustainability bears a completely different meaning than today, or than what we understand it today. We can start with you, Professor, because sure. this is definitely an academic issue as much as an industrial issue. What do you think the relation between technology and the sustainability? Do you believe the simple equation? Definitely there could be a lot of debates. However, to my personal experience, it will be like this. You need to work on one thing for 10 hours to get it done in the past. Now it only takes you one hour. When we're talking about large uh, language model or the other AI which can generate images or videos, we're not actually talking about machines. We're talking about something built up on top of the accumulation of the entire human race, culture, and everything. Before that, if you want to do this, you probably need to spend like decades to make yourself become a master or something. But so can I take that a UI supporter of uh, technologies? big power to, to sustain a future development model that today we view as sustainable. Exactly. So I will nail your color to the mast. And I'll move on to you, Dave. <laughs> you, with, you with us? Yeah, hello. There could be a um, sound an apology for that, but I know that you work in the field of agriculture. Am I right? Yeah, that's right. right. Um, and uh, because the subject matter is uh, the relation between technology and sustainability, sustainable development, and do you believe in your field that the more technologies, the merrier? Okay, so just to give you guys a brief background, I mostly work with rural and urban stakeholders to, together with different nonprofits and government institutions in designing and growing efficient, um, sustainable food production systems. So with this, um, considering that um, we're in a developing country in the Philippines, I mostly engage in the marginalized sector and there is a limitation in financial resources in providing these kinds of services. And aside from that, traditional and organic farming are what these communities got used to and are widely being practiced. So this can be challenging for farmers to adopt and use effectively. However, um, I believe that the integration of AI offers a range of opportunities as well in the agriculture, such as like precision farming um, via using drones or satellites and sensors to optimize planting, irrigation, and harvesting. Um, AI has also been used with supply chain optimization and reducing food waste through better inventory management, um, demanding predictions and optimiza uh, optimization of like transportation routes. But in totality, I think, or I believe rather that AI is still a relatively new technology and can have a lot of limitations, especially in developing countries, because you know costing could be ridiculously expensive, and these uh, this could be inaccessible to small-scale farmers. And um, I think one of the biggest problems would be data requirements for AI that requires large data for machine learning and. Uh, generative learning for that would be also be di difficulty in, in like such countries. So yeah, um, I think while AI offers uh, immense um, promise, 
we also need to recognize its limitation in very, uh, varying contexts that remains crucial. We talk about technology. We talk about sustainability. And I said that sustainability is supposed to be about human, it's supposed to be about human beings. And one important part of being a human is to understand art. Like our two guests have made perfectly clear in this session about culture. Mikael, I'd like to start with you. Mm -hmm. First, tell me, are you worried one day that AI can be a, a musician just like you? I definitely think it varies on the industry, but for me personally, um, I do see AI posing a threat to the creative industry just because I feel like today there are a lot of examples of mm -hmm. AI um, being able to create their own melodies, being able to understand music theory and even compose songs. That's already a thing now. Mm -hmm. and. I feel like because of that, yeah, it does pose a threat, but I feel like AI does lack a certain sense of humanness to it, since it is the creative industry. Um, I do feel like the human aspect is a bit important, and I feel like two examples. Um, for me personally, when I look at somebody that I look up to an idol, it's not only because of their music and how good their music is maybe, but it may be because of their character. For instance, uh, Right now, if I were to choose somebody, maybe I would just choose Bruno Mars, although he's a really great vocalist, a really great songwriter, but also his personality, his character is something that people look at. And I feel like when people look at celebrities and they look at artists, they don't only listen to their music and look up to their music. They look at the person themselves and try to gain inspiration through that person. And you look up to icons like that. And another example is another human aspect is um, Another, uh, Bruno Mars, even um, like Mariah Carey, they're all <laughs> looked up to because of their vocal skills. And that's because we're humans. And maybe even I don't think I can sing like that. Mm -hmm. So when I look at them, I'm like, wow, that's crazy. Only like one in probably a hundred humans can do that. So that's why you listen to their voices, because it's special. And you're a human and you're listening to a human. So it's different in that aspect. So I feel like they're... Certain things like that where I feel like AI, as of now, um, lacks that human element to it. But I also feel like that could also eventually change. Um, there's a movie called Her yeah. that I watched yeah, a I while ago. Like but movie. also, yeah. like, even in that movie, AI started to become more human and became more connectable and you could empathize with it. So I feel like if that does happen, then what I just said isn't true. But <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But I feel like for right now, and I feel like honestly, for the next decade, I feel like at least for my lifetime, I won't see AI take over and replace artists right now. Mm -hmm. I feel like they can add on to the number of artists that are currently existing, but they can't replace artists. It's what I think. I could fully be wrong, but yeah. Do you agree? You know, because we haven't talked yet during this previous sessions, but we right. did have a little conversation mm. when, we, when we were doing our makeups. Uh, you are an architect, architect. So an architect can also be an artist. Mm. Do, do you agree with what Mika just said? Uh, so first of all, I'd like everybody at home in the audience to know we weren't in the makeup chairs very long. <laughs> <It's pretty laughs> natural. Um, we have a, we have uh, a good <laughs> skin. Yeah. So a lot has been said, uh, and I agree with, uh, with a lot of what has been said. Um, I'll just add that I think there are certain industries where the path to replacement, let's say, is much more direct. Like the thing that the current AI models are targeted for, ChatGPT, mm -hmm. Midjourney, things like that, Dolly. If I was an image maker or doing ad copy right now, I'd be pretty anxious. Um, are you allowed to, to introduce um, any kind of uh, not completely controlled by human device into your work? Desi devi uh, designing well, a building? So, uh, I mean, like, I, I think for uh, artists, architects, creative industries, also, I mean, not, not just exclusively, but mm -hmm. the, what will start to happen is not that people will lose their job or mm -hmm. be replaced by AI, but there, there will be a differentiation between people who know how to use AI to their benefit mm -hmm. and people who don't. And that will really create kind of the different uh, levels of sustainability within the market. So back to the, the, the question about sustainability, the technology and its relations with that. I mean, in your field, in ar uh, uh, architecture, mm -hmm. building, uh, constructed buildings, I mean, have you found a you know, way forward that's uh, sustainable 
in whatever way imaginable. So yeah, I, I think, uh, of course, sustainability is a big topic, and it's been a big topic for mm -hmm. a long time within architecture. Um, one of the projects that I worked on in China was um, in Chongqing, where there was a, a earthquake in, near there, in Sichuan in 2008. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was for a school that uh, had experienced structural damage in that earthquake. Um, and our approach to sustainability there was the new site was this beautiful piece of landscaped terraced agriculture. Okay? And we really knew that we wanted to maintain it and preserve it. But that is in direct opposition to building over it. Especially because in China every school needs 100 meter straight track and a 200 meter circular track. So uh, our approach there to sustainability was um, to really use those limitations to our benefit. So we kind of situated the track so that it becomes the floor, uh, the, the floor here and the roof here, and kind of the terrace, the buildings terrace down with the natural inclination of the site. Um, so I mean, I guess to get back to the topic, I don't think an AI model would be able to come up with that solution. Okay, sustainability and climate change. And Dave, I believe if we come to this subject, you are the best of our panelists to answer the question. What do you picture in the future? What the future agriculture like that is environmental, especially environmental friendly, that's gonna help us approaching the issue of climate change? Right, um this topic is really especially uh, close to my heart. Um, I'm an environmental advocate. So for me, uh, sustainability is, um, think of it as like a system that is grounded in a circular economy or as we may relate it to permaculture that offers a sustainable living system and we in which we are root, rooted. So this nature-based uh, Dharma and meditation practice um, is more of like a deeper sense of appreciation to practical, theoretical, and spiritual roots of sustainable and uh, life-affirming future. And I learned that a place filled with the beautiful spirits of nature uh, will endow and nurture men and women with talent and grace. So in summary, I believe that sustainability lies in um, carbon neutrality. That means having a balance between emitting carbon and absorbing carbon from the atmosphere and carbon sinks. And it's not just about uh, doing things differently, but it's also about thinking differently. So we need to shift our mindset from one consumption to one stewardship. We need to see ourselves as uh, part of the natural wor world, not separate from it. We need to make decisions that consider the long-term impacts of the planet and on future generations. Before we move on talking about the leader in any field, and I'd like to seek the professional help from our consultants. Uh, to get certain numbers and the data straight. Uh, first of all, how big is the, the green economy, uh, especially uh, in relation to APAC? So uh, if I remember correctly, so if you think about, um, as we all know that China has started this uh, dual carbon goal, like reaching, uh, uh, reaching the peak of carbon uh, before 2030 and also achieving carbon neutrality before 2060. And in order to achieve this goal, China's already started or like built the largest carbon uh, market in the world. Uh, that's called the emission trading system. And it's, uh, and it's still growing because uh, uh, I think it was in 2021 uh, that we started this uh, nationwide emission trading system that's uh, still expanding to more, uh, to including more heavy industries. And if we do that, that's actually uh, like more than the other uh, countries, uh, uh, like the sum of the other countries' carbon emission market in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, to think about like uh, to to in order in order to combat climate change, uh, another very important thing we've done is to preserve biodiversity. And in order to do that, the APEC actually, do you know that the APEC actually have 80% of the world's forest? Oh. Yeah, that, that's really an amazing number. So it's really important that APEC as a region, as a Asia Pacific region to 
uh, to, you know, to do afforestation to protect our natural forest and also to do more, you know, tree plantations. In that aspect that we're uh, really doing a lot uh, in terms of uh, co combating uh, climate change. Yeah. And I know the both of our consultants and I, you are the students of uh, economy. You, stu you studied in this field long, to, uh, long enough to answer my next question, whoever uh, is going to answer this. Uh, be it a carbon tax market, and uh, Ivan just mentioned there's always an issue in about the capital, about the money. Do you think that a capital is a driving force that's going to help with we deal with the climate change issue and the green development, or sometimes capital or cash can be counter-effective force? Uh, I think part of the reason why electric vehicle has uh, witnessed such a significant growth over the past few years is that we actually have an economic incentive for people to drive ec uh, electronic cars over uh, the traditional uh, uh, oil-filled car cars. And the reason for that is uh, we have actually a system of, of charging pods and, uh, and places uh, for, for the electric vehicles to be driven and to be uh, actually economically profitable for people to drive. So I think part of the, the common goal for uh, policymakers and also for economists is to, is to design a mechanism where it is profitable for people to do the sustainable thing, to live a sustainable lifestyle. And that is what basically what we call a mechanism design, and that is part of the common goal that we need to uh, work uh, towards. Thank you. Thank you to our consultants. And now I'd like to hear again from the uh, observers. Just a focus on sustainability and climate change. Any questions? Um, raise up your hand, please. Oh, uh, the, the lady in the red, yeah. Hi, so I've heard a lot of you all talking about how it's really important to encourage sustainability, but there is the reality that a lot of times sustainability is in conflict with economic growth. So how do you encourage people who are trying to start businesses to pursue businesses that are sustainable? And how would you encourage the youth to go about promoting these things they care about despite some countering forces? Thank you. Thank you for your question. And uh, who volunteers to answer the first? A panelist. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Because everybody, no matter how they live, they want and they have a better home. Right, we, we cannot ask somebody to just keep it pool, keep it uh, like a pretty, like rough things instead of a being having better lives. So I, I think it's a it's, it's it's both challenging, but also takes a lot of wisdom that we probably need to find a way to build up some new things. Like Finland is one of the uh, uh, fascinating place that I went to. I realized that uh, they uh, they have a couple of that, that was a couple of years ago, right? They have a couple of really good game companies, right? And, and they developed their creative industry to support not only their, their, their own place, but also all over the world. And I know this is just a very small scale case, but uh, I think if, if we can work together, we definitely could build up something like that. I think that's about the end of this segment. I'd like to thank you all the panelists and all the observers and the consultants for the beautiful contributions. And, uh, but it's not the end of the whole show because we have another section waiting for us. Welcome back to CGTN special APEC coverage Youth Forum, Empowering the World, Shaping a Promising Future. As we wrap up the invigorating discussions and the connections made in the We Connect phase, we now enter into our last segment, We Envision. Envision. So in this final part of this journey, we are going to invite all of our guests to imagine the future for the APEC region. So I'm going to propose a simple question to all of you guys. What do you think are the new areas or opportunities that APEC can explore and pursue in the near future? 
and everybody one sentence for each answer. Let's start from Chris. You're going to put me on the spot, right? Sure. Um, so I think uh, the most important thing that uh, APEC should focus on is leading industries in the future. I think uh, there's uh, high tech uh, solutions to the world's problems. We have uh, AI, we have uh, sustainable new technology, and I think uh, APEC is positioned well to be bold and lead in the next 20 years. Leading the future, yeah. thank you for that. Jackie? Um, I believe APEC should continue to engage in meaningful dialogue as well as continued import-export as well as cultural exchanges. Thank you for that. Uh, I think uh, opportunities for the future lie at the intersection of uh, the physical and the digital, and I'm very excited to see the hybrids that come out of that. Thank you. AI. Oh. Live and create with AI for a better world. Wonderful answer. Okay, so let's uh, start from this up. Mika? Um, I definitely think youth forums. Today is a good example. I think giving the youth a platform have an, and an opportunity to learn and to voice their own opinions, I think, is something that I really um, encourage because I think there's a lot of good um, youth and a lot of youth that have a lot of potential out there. Mm, I think our guests yeah. really have different definitions on one sentence, but I'm okay <laughs> with that. Please. Yeah. Bridging the gap in education because the future of human capital development hinges on the Asia Pacific's ability to grow. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the professor? I would like to echo the title of today's event. To empower the world with innovation and economic opportunities, we will need cross disciplinary, cross culture, and also cross region. One plus one, we got more than two. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, our, our panelists today. And also, let's hear from our two online representatives. And uh, we are glad to be joined by students from Papua New Guinea and uh, Vietnam who share their vision for the future. I would like to see PNG benefit, PNG and other smaller uh, economies benefit through sound and fair trade and investment uh, initiatives within the APEC uh, group. And uh, I hope to see that in the future, larger APEC economies like, economies like China, USA and Australia to take uh, the, the lead and uh, draft the trade policies that would enhance the uh, growth. Uh, and participation of uh, the smaller uh, APEC economies in the APEC uh, area. Thank you very much. 大家好,我叫阮关尚,来自越南,现在就读于广西师范大学。我希望未来能够成为越南和APEC论坛的桥梁,也为国家发展做出贡献。谢谢大家。those were students from Papua New Guinea and the Vietnam. Papua New Guinea was put in the global spotlight when the country hosted the APEC Forum back in 2018, and the Vietnam hosted APEC twice in 2006 and in 2017. With that, we come to the conclusion of our APEC Youth Forum discussion. I'd like to thank all the our delegates who shared their thoughts today with us. And I also like to express gratitude to our media partners. They are from TV Peru and Vietnam Soha Network. Thank you for empowering the voice of young people from around the Asia Pacific region. The APEC meeting is no doubt one of the biggest global events of the year. It will have a huge impact on many of the issues we discussed here. Some of them are likely to accompany us all the way to 2024 and beyond. That's why you need to stay tuned to CGTN's special impact coverage on the big screen as well as from your smartphone. But for now, thank you for your company. I'm Dean Yang. I'm Elaine Chen. Bye for now. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.